tax planning. It's the process of anticipating and arranging the management and disposal of person's assets in the event of future physical incapacity or death. The way this is done is by making a will, wherein the assets are identified for the legal hires and then naming the executor who will be in charge of transfer of assets and then the beneficiaries who are the dependents or the loved ones and then setting up trust which is a fiduciary or third party arrangement wherein a trustee manages the assets on behalf of the beneficiaries and also many times making arrangements towards funeral expenses. So one thing, what do you think is most important in estate planning? It is the valuation of the estate. So the way the valuation is done is, uh, it, it, for instance, uh, for the broad standard for carrying out valuation for any industry is basically three standards. One is fair value, fair market value, and then synergis synergistic uh, value. So the fair value is the estimated price of an asset when buyer and seller come together and agree upon a price. Whereas market value is when the market determinants or the market forces are in place. And synergistic value is when uh, the value of synergies or benefits is realized uh, when one company combines with another business entity or a strategic partner. So when we have a clear valuation of the estate, it solves many problems. The first is that uh, it makes clear what the legal, legal hires are inheriting and then it, it minimizes disputes uh, amongst them. The second is it Basically, uh, uh, you know, it, it kind of um, strategizes the distributions among the among all the legal hires that, in a way, actually can minimize the taxes and also be compliant uh, with the regulations. So, what's important here is everybody talks about fair market value, but when you are giving ten percent of your company to your son. Is the value of that share exactly the same as if you were to give it to a third party in the market? Probably not. So if you have the right expert, they can help you differentiate between fair value in this case as opposed to fair market value, which is legally accepted by IRS. Fair value standards are legally accepted by IRS, which in many cases are lower, producing lower value than fair market value in a divorce case. Do you use fair value or fair market value? Do you use fair value? Because you are more connected to the house. A third party wouldn't pay the same price as opposed to the spouse who wants to live in that house. So they have pride attached to it. They have feelings attached to it. And these standards, fair value standards are accepted by IRS. So if you have the right expert who can help you differentiate, you can have a, a, a much better result than internal. So coming to the minimizing of taxes, um, there are basically uh, four main key strategies to minimize taxes. You need to know your options. Uh, the first option is like for estate tax planning, up to twelve, uh, up to thirteen point six million, six million can be, um, uh, you know, transferred uh, tax free, and both husband and wife, it will be like twenty seven point six million dollars. That can be twenty seven point two million dollars. Uh, that that can be trans transferred tax free. Uh, the second is through gifting wherein every year you can make uh, like $18,000 of gift to uh, any number of people you have and not incur any liability. The third is irrevocable trust, wherein uh, you set up a trust exclusively for the sake of the beneficiary and the earnings on this trust grow tax-free um, and can be used by the beneficiaries and even the grantor would not be incurring any additional liability. And finally, the fourth one is the insurance, uh, uh, taking the insurance, I definitely, uh, you know, um, tell you to explore this in very good uh, uh, 
very good uh, uh, you know strategies that can uh, really minimize your stacks the basic concept is that you take the uh, you know, and uh, uh, you basically take take the unqualified uh, insurance policy and that after you retire you start drawing money out of it you take basically the loans uh, out of the same insurance policy like 100000 every year and finally when the insurance policy matures after 20 years there is say like 5 million the policy is worth so 2 million will go towards paying the loans and the 3 million uh, you are uh, you know dependent loved ones can use uh, use that money so what's the gray area here you can create a lifetime income without actually paying any taxes and how do you go about doing it lifetime income without paying any taxes so you have a life insurance by definition loans are not taxable so you create a life insurance that has cash value you keep taking loans against that life insurance Once you die, let's say the the face value is five million. You took so far the distribution was three million. Your family will get two million. But now it's that proceed five million, and that proceed are tax free. There are a lot of grey areas over here which are legally uh, accepted, allowed by IRS. So knowing that can help you uh, in uh, planning it right. Uh, so just a joke before I go go on to the carriage interest. So there is a there is this teacher, third grade teacher, and she gives this uh, problem to all of the kids. She, she says that of the four million, one million goes to uh, son, one million to the wife, the one million to a uh, business partner, and the other one million to his friend. What does each one get? And then uh, all the other kids are busy calculating uh, as to how much it should be that each one should get. But there is one one small boy who immediately raises his hand, and do you know what he says? He says, "A lawyer, because each one wants to get more money, so each one brings their own lawyer." We have some lawyer plans over here, so so no, this is bad. <laughs> so the joke is that this four million, the person passes away. Son gets million, daughter gets million, and the question is, how does everybody, how much everybody gets? So a lawyer. Does everybody want a lawyer? I'm not just <laughs> saying jokes, but yeah, I did try. <laughs> so carried interest. Carried interest is basically a share of profits of an investment that a fund manager gets. It is, in other words, the return on investment that um, an investor, that investment manager is uh, availing. but the key difference between carried interest and other stock market investment is that the benefit of compensation is dependent or contingent upon the performance of the business in future and the best advantage is that carried interest is taxed only at 20% the maximum that would that be tracked that would be uh, taxed and for uh, otherwise it would be it would apply like ordinary income tax rate which would be much higher to give you an example for somebody earning a very high tax bracket range like 445 850000 under carried interest it would be only 20% whereas in ordinary income tax rate the 38% would apply thereby saving him 17% uh, so this strategy does not apply to everybody this strategy is specifically for Private equity managers, venture capitalists, and fund managers, people who have an angel investor, and a lot of you are. When you have invested money, the amount of money you get back depends on the performance of the company. In that case, the concept is if you leave the money in that investment for more than one year, then your income is not considered as regular income. Your income is considered as long-term capital gain. In this country. The maximum rate is 20 percent, as opposed to 37 percent that the government wants to charge the capital income. So the concept is, and it's not for everybody. Only for angel investor, hedge fund manager, private equity manager. If you leave the money in that investment for n number of days, and that's one year, then the invest the return on the investment is long term capital gain as opposed to capital income. Uh, so just to end, uh, there was this very interesting case about uh, in 2010 where uh, Dell was basically acquired by a private equity firm, which is Silver Lake Partners, and they did they came in based with the purpose to restructure the company, and uh, part of their incentive was uh, carried interest. 
So eventually, they were able to raise the profitability of the business much more. It was more highly valued. They got in uh, uh, their uh, incentive from that, and even from the carried interest, which is uh, in fact a very interesting uh, case study if you want to look up. And finally, before I end, uh, there is uh, this one thing. Do you know why? Uh, uh, what is the other name for uh, long-term investment? It is uh, a failed short-term investment because these investors they keep investing again and again to see whether their investment grows. Until then, it's all locked up as uh, long-term investment. That's what my husband says when I ask him about his investment. Oh yes, I'm doing like a long-term investment. That's what he says to me. Because we are size scale, you're gonna see us. We are consistent <laughs> and on repeat. Okay. So my topic is something like I think it's everybody's favorite topic and my favorite too. It's getting something maximized in the tax return. Because all the time we go to accountants or people come to us, they are talking about minimizing the tax liability, but maximizing the deduction. Because everybody wants to claim any expense they are making. Either it is a chocolate, it's a chip, fuel, or a big investment. They want to claim it on the tax return. So definitely, but doing it right is important here. Because if we are messing around, then we know who is knocking at our door. It will be IRS. So, the maximized deduction has different categories and there are different applicability also based on what kind of the business you have or what kind of individual profile do you have. And those things fall based on that. So, we have like itemized and standard deductions. Definitely claiming more deductions. It's like if you have a more high mortgage interest, if you have a business expenses that you, you are thinking of claiming, then it's going for the itemized deductions benefits you more than going for the standard deduction. But if, but it's not a right thing to say that it's like a you know straight thing. No, it depends case to case. So definitely the scenario will be different. The second thing is claiming the business expenses. Everybody is aware about it because bunch of receipts we get in the tax season and all we are doing is finding out what we have to claim in the business. Business expense, for example, my favorite example, if you go to Dunkin' Donuts, buy a coffee for a dollar, is that a business expense? It's not, because you bought the coffee for yourself. If you go to the same Dunkin' Donuts, buy a fifty dollar gift card now. And now you use that gift card to buy the coffee every day. Now it's a business expense. How so? Because we know, we don't know just if you are using the gift card, we only know $50 is spent on Dunkin' Donuts. You cannot be spending $50 on yourself. You must have taken the clients over there or the staff over there. The idea is, the point I'm making is, if the expense is large enough, we take it as a business expense. You, you go to Subway, if it's $5, it's not a business expense. If it's $80, well, $80, you did not even do yourself. So you have to be cognizant about how the system will look at it. One more thing is leveraging the charitable donation. Definitely, if you are charity, uh, like you are making a donation to 501c3 organizations, non-profit, you can claim it on your tax return. The recent update I was just watching an Instagram read and I just follow one page and she was talking about that she just donated her wedding dress to non-profit and she claimed that as a business expense. So that is the scenario too. People do that. Yeah, so, so yes. don't watch that. Yeah. <laughs> So in the, in the charitable donation, the, the example that I like to take, if you want to donate $100 to charity, and we have a lot of good charities over here, uh, you should donate in the cash. If you donate appreciated the stock, you bought a stock for $10. Now it's $100. You donate the stock. You get the benefit of $100 and you don't have to pay tax for $90. So instead of donating the cash, if you donate an appreciated asset, then you don't have to pay any tax and appreciation. You get the full benefit of the donation, and then the charity can sell the, the assets, the stock, and get the money. That's how you want to do it. The other thing is, I, everyone is aware about would keep like the strategy of people claiming it as like tax credit, keeping Elon, Elon Musk in the life, mm -hmm. keeping him as a billionaire because people are just aware about the electronic vehicle credit which was there, but now it is maximized, so people are buying cars, investing, and taking the credit. That also falls under the deduction. Now, how it will benefit? Definitely, it will, it will reduce your tax liability. It will increase the refunds, because if you have overpaid, if your withholdings are done more, but the, if the tax return is done in a manner where it should be done, and with expertise knowledge, chances of getting the refunds are high. 
definitely if you get the refunds, it take you towards the savings and the proper financial planning will be done because you will be knowing where your money are going and how you are doing it right. Then the most uh, efficient ways when we move forward is like the investment structures. It's like maximize deductions, we took the deductions, now talk about what about if I'm putting the money, if I'm investing, what are the benefits I'm getting in return. So these are the strategies that is the tax efficient investment structures where you have made the investment and now you can claim it in your tax returns to take the deductions based on that, credits based on that. So the for examples are tax advantage accounts. Mr. Kumar will be talking more about it in the coming slides definitely. That is about putting money in the 401k, step IRAs, getting your wealth planning done right. Then long term investing where you are putting money in the real estate or you are putting investments in the stock market, how it will be taxed, that, that will come. Then comes the investment, investing in the tax exempt securities, as you must be aware about the government bonds and securities in the market, where you put the money into it and you get the benefits along it. The more, the, the topic is the tax loss harvesting. Uh, it is the well known strategy, I would say, or maybe unknown, it depends. Because let's understand it with the example. If somebody is having a stock portfolio and he's planning to book a good, a good gain in the end of the year, so how to compensate that while avoiding or defer the taxes for that particular to pay? So what you do is you just go and look for the stocks, which are loss taking stocks. So you can, what you can do is you can offset by booking the loss against the gain you are booking, you can offset the gain part and you are deferring the taxes for that particular year. So you can continue that practice for the next year by reinvesting it. So reinvesting can be done into the same stock because definitely if you are if your stock is in loss, you are booking a loss in the December and if you are buying it in January, less chances of it going at a profitable day. So just be aware of the what is rule over here. You cannot buy the same stock within 30 days prior or after. So it's a 61 days window that they have. But uh, the, if you use it effectively, it can potentially save you in the same portfolio, similar portfolio, and it still save you a lot of money. Yes. So as I mentioned about the long-term capital gain as one of the tools, I will call Nina on the stage and she will explain you one of the very good strategies where people are actually making money and have become millionaires. 